Sandy Starr, and I'd like to welcome you all to this debate entitled Epigenetics, uh, Are You What Your Parents Ate? And uh, since we're about to debate epigenetics, a good place to start is what epigenetics is. But instead of doing that, I'm going to start by talking about what epigenetics isn't. So on page 30 of the Battle of Ideas print brochure, you don't have to turn to your own copy, it's okay, but... Uh, in fairness, this blurb is severely ab abbreviated from uh, a more subtle one on the Battle of Ideas website, uh, but it says epigenetics explores how we can inherit acquired characteristics. I've been reliably informed by today's panel that this is categorically wrong. This would be um, Lamarckism or, or neo-Lamarckism, and, and epigenetics is not that. So we appear to have got ourselves into a tangle uh, over the meaning of epigenetics before the debate has even begun. I could try to untangle it myself, uh, epigenetics being something that comes up, as I mentioned in my day job, uh, but thankfully I don't have to, uh, because we've got three um, very distinguished speakers uh, who can do a much better job than me of getting us out of this tangle, explaining what epigenetics is, uh, and perhaps more contentiously, uh, talking about what the ramifications of epigenetics might be uh, for society. So I'll introduce our three speakers briefly, uh, and in the order in which they're going to speak, but for a fuller account of their many accomplishments, because I can only be brief, uh, please see their biographies um, on the Battle of Ideas website. So kicking us off on my far right, spatially but not politically, she was uh, keen for me to, to point out, we have Professor Marilyn Monk, a pioneer uh, in the field of epigenetics. Marilyn is Emeritus Professor of Molecular Embryology at University College London's Institute of Child Health, and nearly 30 years ago now, uh, her research showed that the expression of genes is programmed by epigenetic modifications of DNA. So there couldn't be a better person, really, to introduce the subject of epigenetics unless it was the person on my immediate right, uh, who is Professor Marcus Pembury, another pioneer uh, in the field of epigenetics, whom we're also very fortunate to have on our panel today. And Marcus is founding chair of the Progress Educational Trust, where I work, uh, which makes him my boss's boss, and it means that disconcertingly I am chairing my chair uh, today. <laughs> so I'd better be careful what I say. And Marcus also happens to be uh, Emeritus Professor of Pediatric Genetics at the Institute of Child Health, and in recent decades uh, he's been responsible for many landmark contributions uh, to both the theory and the clinical practice of genetics, um, and latterly epigenetics. So we're delighted to have him here. And uh, last but by no means least, uh, on my left, uh, we have John Gillett, uh, who is a Battle of Ideas veteran uh, and who's a PhD researcher at the Economic and Social Research Council's Centre for Social and Economic Research on Innovation in Genomics. He's also co-author of a superb book that came out nearly 20 years ago. I was hiding it because he's modest. This is my rather dog-eared copy uh, of Science and the Retreat from Reason, uh, which is a classic work that situates uh, science in a broader political and historical context. Uh, it's something I hope John is going to do for us today, only this time with the specific field uh, of epigenetics. So, Marilyn, could you please kick us off and explain for our benefit what epigenetics is? Thank you, Sandy. Hello, everybody. I'm an academic research scientist, which means I've spent 50 years of my life in a laboratory exploring life, and it was a great privilege, and I loved every minute of it. And my field is molecular, originally molecular biology, which is a study of life at a subcellular level. It's a study of molecules, the DNA, the genes, the proteins <coughs> made by the genes. And I'm also, halfway through my career, became a developmental biologist, which is the study of how life shapes up, how embryo shapes up into the fetus, and or the orchestration of gene function that uh, uh, develops into all the different tissues of the fetus. Now, epigenetics is the... Um, so I'll be talking about epigenetics mostly from molecular and developmental uh, aspects. Now, the thing that we all, to start with, that we all know, we have 20,000 genes in all of our cells. All of our cells have 20,000 genes in duplicate, half of them from the mother, from the egg, and half of them from the father, from the sperm. But you know that all of our cells are different. There's about 100 different cell types in the body. There's nerve cells, muscle cells, skin cells, and so on. So if they all have the same genes, this is fairly obvious 
there must be different subpopulations of genes active in the different cells according to requirement for function in the different tissues. So some, cell, some genes are active and some are inactive, and this is uh, carried out by epigenetic programming. So nerve genes are active in nerve cells, but not in any other cells. And so muscle genes are active in muscle cells, and, not, and so on. Um, so, uh, so this was what makes the cells different. And the term <coughs> epigenetics was coined about in the 1950s by Waddington in Edinburgh, because we, there must be some way the genes are differentially active and silent to, to, uh, uh, to, to make all the different cells. Um, the way I look at epigenetic program in analogy with computers, it's like the genes are the hardware. They're the full potential of what your cells can do. And the epigenetic programming is like the software. And, and these days, we're becoming much more interested in the epigenetic programming of the genes and the genes themselves. Now, when does this programming happen? Well, obviously, it happens in the womb, in the development of the fetus, because as the fetus develops different... Uh, tissue lineages separate and, and, and take different pathways. So that's when, pro, uh, that's called tissue specific programming, epigenetic programming. But before, actually I forgot to say uh, a few of the mechanisms by which it happens. The first, there are about three mechanisms that are well known, but I can think of another three or four that we're not working on at the moment. And the first one is called methylation of the DNA-based cytosine. As you know, the DNA is just a long strand, two strands wound around each other, and there's four bases in different arrangements specifying the genes. Now, the cytosines is one of those bases, and it can be chemically modified by attaching a methyl group to it. And if the cytosines in front of a particular gene in a regulatory region of a gene, if they're methylated, then that gene is turned off. So that's one mechanism that can be worked with. The second mechanism is the packaging of the chromosomes. The chromosomes, the long helix of DNA, is wound around bunches of proteins called nucleosomes. And the nucleosomes consist of histones. You don't need to know all these words. But the histones themselves, those proteins can be modified by methylation and acetylation. And according to the way the proteins are modified, the DNA is wrapped around, that also can determine whether a gene is active or inactive. And a third method is that some genes are specifically regulatory genes. In other words, they make a copy of themselves called RNA, and the RNA then goes and finds other genes that it recognizes and turns them off. So that's the third mechanism by regulatory RNA molecules. Now, when does it happen? I've already talked about tissue-specific epigenetic programming in the development of the fetus. And then we have a, what I call adaptive epigenetic programming. And that's adapting you, the individual, from the beginning of life to the end of life to the environment. There are two phases of intensive epige adaptive epigenetic program. The one is, one phase is when the fetus is in the womb and it's experiencing the environment of the mother. So via the placenta, um, it can be programmed with what's happening in the mother, with her nutrition, whether she's resting, whether she's stressed. If she's stressed, the fetus can actually be programmed for stress, which could last for life, uh, whether she's drinking, smoking, so on. So it's a very important phase of programming the fetus to its environment in the womb. And then another obvious phase when there's a big environment change is when the baby's born. So the baby's born into a new environment, physical, nutritional, psychological, emotional, good parenting, bad parenting, and in the first few years of life, there's more intensive programming that determines for life that child's life view, potential, well-being, and so on, a sense, uh, uh, um, susceptibility to lifestyle diseases like cardiovascular disease, diabetes, obesity, stroke, etc., mental illness. A lot of programming happening according to uh, how the, the, the environment of the early parenting and of the, of the newborn. Now, I'm just going to mention very briefly, when the fetus or newborn, or, and then we've got adaptive programming happening throughout life in adults, according to how you're living your life, your nutrition, whether you get enough sleep, whether you're stressed, um, you're circulating lots of chemicals around the body, which are turning genes on and off. If stress is sustained for long periods, then you can expect that some genes may be turned off more or less permanently. And again, how you live your life as an adult uh, with the genes adapting to the environment, turning on or off according to environment, determines your well-being and susceptibility to disease. 
And also some of this program is thought that it possibly could happen in the germ cells of the adult, in the sperm and the eggs, in which case the offspring of that parent will be programmed safe for stress, even though the stress was experienced by the parent. Possible, is it possible that it can go into the next generation and the next so-called Lamarckian inheritance, and I'm sure that Marcus will be ad addressing that. Just to finally say, we've had debates for a long time about nature versus nurture. Nature's the gene, nurture's the environment. But today, we don't look at it like nature versus nurture. We see epigenetics as the interplay at the interface of nature and nurture. So it's actually not like genes versus environment, but it's the interface, the interplay between your genes and your environment happening all the time. Thank you. I'm a clinical geneticist, so I uh, look at pedigrees. And uh, during my clinical practice, uh, I came across various uh, um, conditions uh, where they neither fitted um, the pattern of inheritance that we know from Mendel, classic genetics, nor could they be attributed to um, uh, cultural inheritance, uh, the um, uh, passing down of um, learning uh, social patterning. One such syndrome associated with severe learning difficulties, particularly absence of speech and certain uh, developmental other uh, abnormalities, uh, structure and so on, called Angelman syndrome, didn't fit uh, these, uh, uh, either of these patterns. And when we looked in, in detail, we found that it was due to a mutation in one of the many genes that humans have called imprinted genes. Now, imprinted genes are basically um, genes which are either active or silent, depending on whether they come through egg or sperm formation. They're, the silencing of them, it doesn't change the DNA sequence. It is just that there is a response of the genome, carrying that bit of the gene, that when it goes through egg formation, uh, results in these molecules, methylation being an example, uh, switching it off, or at least putting a mark on that chromosome that it is, uh, so that it will be switched off uh, in the next generation. And so that got me interested in epigenetics because um, genomic imprinting is the classic example of uh, epigenetics from a sort of medical genetics point of view. Now, um, in parallel with my work as a clinical geneticist at Great Ormond Street and the Institute of Child Health, I helped Jean Golding set up the Avon Longitudinal Study of Parents and Children. The idea was to follow the people from the general population, about 85% of them uh, representative of the, uh, of the population, from early pregnancy right through, they're now 21. This is called the children of the 90s locally. It's had quite a lot of publicity. And I was interested in gene-environment interaction. And as we've heard from Marilyn, um, where life meets the genome, uh, we have these epigenetic mechanisms, regulatory mechanisms, particularly where the uh, influence uh, of the exposure is long-lasting, endures. And uh, this got me interested in those situations where um, adult diseases, coronary artery disease, diabetes, and so on, had been increasingly shown to be associated with the growth of the fetus and, indeed, uh, the um, food supply, social economic position of the children when they were young. This is an enduring effect that carries through. It's a bit like um, the Jesuit uh, maxim, you know, give me the uh, child till he's seven and I'll give you the man. There, we know about formative years, and so it sort of made sense that epigenetics might be the explanation for these enduring effects. To cut a long story short, colleagues in Holland studied the famine during the end of the war uh, in Holland, and we studying um, the social economic position in the 1958 cohort. These are people who were born in 1958, and we are now looking at them at the age of 45. We have been able to show that there are patterns of DNA methylation, um, which is this epigenetic mark, uh, 
that correlates more strongly with their childhood circumstances and experiences, <clears throat> or their fetal experiences, than um, their current adult situation. And so it seems likely that epige adaptive epigenetic <coughs> mechanisms will embed this experience uh, biologically and change the gene expression over a long period of time. Now, we realize, of course, that blood cells, and we were looking at blood cells in these studies, uh, both the Dutch and us with the um, even longitudinal study of children, uh, parents and children, that um, blood cells don't last 40 or 60 years. So where is the signature being captured? It's probably being captured in the stem cells, the cells that renew, keep renewing the blood cells, or it just conceivably could be uh, resetting the hormone and meta metabolism set points. So um, those are reset for life and, uh, and all cells are bathed in a change. So if it's getting into the stem cells, does it get into the germ cells and have an effect on the next generation? I had speculated in 96, the 94 conference published in 96, that imprinting provided a mechanism whereby uh, the experience in one generation could modify the gene expression in subsequent generations as a form of adaptation. In 2000, uh, Oli Bigren from northern Sweden contacted me and they had some remarkable results showing that the food supply, because they had swings of uh, high and low food supply in the previous centuries in northern Sweden, the food supply of the of the father's father or the father's mother at critical periods in early childhood um, influenced the longevity of the grandchildren. The father's father's food supply in mid-childhood influenced the longevity and mortality rate of the grandsons and of the father's mother um, of the granddaughters. This seemed too specific to dismiss as social patterning and suggests that perhaps there are some biological mechanisms, epigenetics being uh, a good candidate for this transgenerational response is what I call it. When I was thinking about what to kind of emphasise or talk about, uh, I, was, I went back to a book I read a couple of years ago by an American epidemiologist uh, called Jeffrey Cabot called Hyping Health Risks and it's a kind of inside the critique of how epidemiological science is used to, and can be used, sometimes is used by scientists and others, to exaggerate the risks uh, that people face from all kinds of things in the environment um, around them. And he finishes on, a, on an interesting point. And the point is, really, he says, don't blame the press or the politicians, or certainly don't blame them entirely. He says, also look to what scientists are up to, natural, natural scientists, that is, and how there's a kind of interaction that goes on. And I just want to start by... Quoting what he says, he talks about complex interactions. This is between this is a natural science complex interaction. This is between politicians, the press, and uh, natural scientists. Complex interactions between the producers and consumers of knowledge in the area of public health, with the participation of scientists, regulators, and advocates, journalists, and others. In each of the case studies discussed in the in all the chapters of his book, certain results were selected, highlighted, and publicised, whereas other relevant facts and considerations were ignored. Isolated findings then become counters in a form of ritual circulation among the different parties that gave them credence. Divorced from any context, these ostensibly scientific findings became things in themselves and their circulation in the wider society appeared to give them solidity and to confirm them. I want to focus on this. Um, I think it's relevant to, to what we're discussing today. Now, don't get me wrong, um, epigenetics, the science of epigenetics, is clearly sound and solid in many of the ways that Malden and Marcus have discussed. It's got some solid conceptual foundations, and we also know um, from some animal studies and also some human studies that it's got some solid empirical uh, basis and plausible causal kind of hypotheses. And Marcus mentioned the Dutch hunger winter study, which was a well-collected set of data, not by design, but by, by as it turned out, it was extreme circumstances, it's a plausible causal mechanism, and it, you know, in all these ways it appears uh, fairly robust. But I think in many other areas, some of the points that Kabat makes about epidemiology and how things can get wrenched out of context, things can get focused on, exaggerated, 
and how scientists play a role in this is an important warning. So in kind of rather bullet-style fashion, I'm going to spit out some kind of observations and criticisms of some of the things that's discussed in this area. And I'm focusing in particular on what some scientists say, especially in popularisations um, of the work and in the conclusions and the claims to greater significance, rather than blaming you know, the press or the media. The first point to make is about epigenetics and evolutionary uh, theory. Now, Sandy said in the beginning, this isn't Lamarckianism, they're blaming the editor of the uh, Battle of Ideas brochure. But, you know, it's not just, um, you know, people are popularising say this. If you look at one of the most po uh, popular books written by a scientist on this subject, Nessa, Nessa Carey's book on, on epigenetics, she's a, an academic, worked in industry for a long time, and now written a, a, a book on the subject for a popular audience. She quite clearly says that we could um, consider aspects of epigenetics to be a kind of form of, of Lamarckianism, um, and she considers the, the transgenerational aspect, the fact that the acquired characteristics can run through several, up to four generations perhaps, and how that could then start to modify the kind of way we would think about and understand evolution. So there are some important things to think about there and to put out there, and it's not simply a mischaracterization by the popular press where this idea is coming from. I think another and more subtle point again, about evolutionary theory, which is in the background here, is that another popular book by a, a professor at King's College, who we all actually went to see and listen in another in a debate at uh, the Linnean Society, Tim Spector, his book out on um, Identically Different, I think it's called, he argues that there's a kind of evolved plasticity, that natural selection has created plasticity in the human genome. And I think Marcus is kind of hinting at that, perhaps, in some of his saying, which I think is within evolution theory is a very contentious idea, and this idea is lobbed out there. But you'll find a lot of um, evolutionary theorists think this is a very dubious idea and think that to focus on natural selection as, a key, uh, as the key thing in evolution rather than all sorts of other things around drift as creating plasticity, which itself is a problematic concept perhaps, which in itself links to epigenetics, another potentially problematic idea. This is the circulation of things that Kabat's talking about. There's a number of quite deep things in the background on, going on here which are often just put on the table as if these are reasonable ideas, but in fact they're very uh, contentious and drawn disputed ideas. Next thing I want to mention is nature-nurture, uh, difference in causality. Again, massive long-standing debates on nature-nurture, as I'm sure many of you are familiar, going back you know, many years and lots of critiques on this. What's interesting is how, again, many of the scientists leap into this debate and say, well cracked it, you know, mediated via epigenetics. If there's a difference that's not in the genes, it must be epigenetics. It's kind of a bucket category. Toss it all in there. That's it. You've got your explanatory um, a, a hypothesis. And indeed, Tim Spector, who's a great enthusiast for all these things, you know, is immensely quotable. If I can find the correct gene, he talks about, you know, genetic differences linked to happiness, homosexuality, susceptibility to anything and everything you could think of. And if identical twins differ in it, What's the explanation? It's got, to be, it's got to be epigenetics. So a whole number of problematic categories are kind of thrust out there and are linked to epigenetics if it's not genetics. There's a bit of the fervour of the convert going on here. You know, a former genetic determinist becomes an epigenetic enthusiast uh, and determinist. Again, very subtle debates about the nature of causality, about how something, um, a trait itself might have a different character to things that cause differences in it. All sorts of quite subtle philosophical debates are kind of being dived into there um, without any uh, consideration of what that, that might mean. I think the third thing um, I want to highlight as being a problem here is the simple thing that Kabat talks about mainly, which is the whole thing about speculation, exaggeration, what you might call the kind of final paragraph problem in academic papers or in Inspector's case, the whole book problem. It's allowed in, in academic papers to you know, be a little bit general and broad in the beginning, then you kind of got to pull yourself down with the data, make some firm conclusions backed up by the data, but you're allowed at the end to start, you know, being more general again. So you'll find, even in the, some of the more you know, clear academic papers on the Dutch hunt, hunger winter, for example, you'll find them pinning themselves down all the way through, then at the end making speculative comments about the obesity uh, today, for example, and say, well, maybe the flip is true. If, if severe famine in Nazi-occupied Holland can cause problems down the line, perhaps obesity in California can cause problems down the line. Marcus himself does a little bit of this sometimes when he talks about, you know, um, the obesity issue today, saying, well, maybe, you know, look at these studies in Sweden, perhaps this other issue, contemporary thing, perhaps we should talk about this. It's a classic kind of conclusion thing. As I say, with, with Spectre, though, you get it running right through, um, right through the entire uh, book, you know, homosexuality, plastics in plastic bottles, all the kind of things you might be familiar with, 
of that kind of panics. He says, he says, well, everyone's looked at this, says there's no problem, but perhaps, perhaps epigenetics will raise a problem. Back on his last paragraph, his whole book makes the point. He says, the Human Genome Project gave license to this kind of speculation, and I might suggest that um, perhaps the epi epigenetics risks the same thing. I have a few quick questions for the panel before I go out to the audience, and I'm going to start by taking some of what John has said uh, and putting it to you, Marilyn. Um, you talked about the nature-nurture uh, distinction and how the versus is misleading. Or some people, I think nature-nurture is from Shakespeare's Tempest. Some people say nature and culture. And the idea I, I was you know, uh, raised with was that your nature is your circumstances as you find them and your culture is your circumstances as you or we uh, change them. Now, granted, epigenetics adds a lot of subtlety to the relationship between those two sorts of categories, nature and nurture or nature and culture and maybe some traffic in both directions. But uh, I can't help want believing, or at least wanting to believe, that uh, culture, the circumstances as we make them, are in the ascendant, that ultimately we transcend our biology. But your characterization seems to be a little more flat. Have I understood you correctly? No. I think it will happen in, in both directions. In other words, according to our lifestyle, we're subjecting our genes constantly to particular chemicals in our body, internal environment, <coughs> circulating, uh, signaling molecules, telling us we're stressed or happy or whatever, and our external environment, which we have a lot of control over what we eat and whether we're exercising and whether we look after our own well-being. But according to internal, external environment, I don't think that there's any question that our genes don't respond to the changing chemical composition and in information transfer within and without. And then as we change, it's possible that we change our environment. In other words, mm -hmm. we change our physical environment, we change our nutritional environment, we change our relationship environment, we change our well-being environment. We can do that. And then that, again, that is our lifestyle changes and our life view changes, even at the point of your imagination, because the imagination fires your neurology mm. and physiology, same as the real thing. Think you're scared and everything will happen. Your, your blood flow, hair standing on end, your temperature, etc., your pupils dilated will happen as if something scary is really happening. Or imagine something good to eat and you'll salivate like Pav Pavlov's dogs. So, yes, so we change our environment and then... As Marcus says, if it's sustained, it has to be sort of 24-7. It's no good sort of doing something just now and then. It has to be a big change. Then that will work back on us again. Right. So there's a sort of in, what I call interplay interface from both directions. It's, it's a rich sort of dialectical thing, but you don't yeah. think either sort of trumps the other no. ultimately? No, because at the interface, neither of those are there. Neither, I mean, your genes are here, mm -hmm. your environment's here, the interface... Is, is not is where they meet. Uh, I suppose you could argue what... I think what trumps depends on what we do about it. OK. OK. Yeah. Mark, as you can pick up on that, if you like, but I'd like to also um, steer you. Um, you spoke recently at the annual conference of the British Society for Human Genetics, and uh, we, we did some publicity around that, and one message that you gave, and I think John has alluded to this, is that there are possible... Um, public health ramifications of epigenetics. Indeed, mm. our, our government, our politicians may wish or may need do well to take it on board. Um, how so? Well, I think that um, we have to look at two circumstances. Uh, the first is uh, enduring effects throughout the lifetime of an individual. And to some extent, the general public accept this. We've always talked about formative years and so on. And there are very clear examples of taking, for example, medical students, people who were going into the medical school at Johns Hopkins in the States, they um, noted that uh, a third of them had come from a lower social economic uh, uh, circumstances. And um, they were able to show um, uh, 50, 30, 40 years later that those who came from lower social economic circumstances, uh, poorer and so on, uh, were more likely to get heart attacks, um, even though they were all uh, earning pretty much the same at that time and living a fairly comfortable life. So we have to explain this enduring effect. And the thing about the DNA methylation, which Marilyn touched on, that I just want to emphasize again, it explains how um, 
the effect uh, on gene expression can be passed from cell to daughter cell. This is explained in, uh, by the biochemistry uh, quite clearly. There's, so it is a mechanism for an enduring effect. Um, so that is important from public health strategies to, to realise that interventions, when somebody's already got heart attacks and things, so just really um, they're helpful to keep them alive for a while, but the real sea change from a population public health point of view is going to be understanding this life course effect and when are the critical periods. And then when you come to transgenerational things, and here in humans we have to accept we haven't proven it's these gene epigenetic mechanisms, we have to bear in mind that, and I will come back to the obesity thing, the obesity uh, rise in obesity now may not solely be due, we have good data for this, um, due to what happened in this generation. Um, the experience of previous gen parental generation in particular um, probably has primed this subsequent uh, generation for, uh, to respond to our present food supply <laughs> with obesity. Okay, thank you Marcus. And then uh, finally, uh, John, in light of what Marcus has just said, even, even taking on board all your caveats, I mean, um, the well-known scientific theorist uh, Ice Cube uh, famously said, check yourself before you wreck yourself, uh, which is the essence of a lot of public uh, health policy and advice. And, and uh, are there not sufficient grounds with epigenetic to say, you know, check yourself before you wreck someone else, you know, your offspring, your descendants, or what have you? Uh, is this not legitimate? I mean, it's one of these classic things where we know that it works and it matters in, in a, some cases, but these tend to be fairly extreme things, like the Dutch hunger winter. Um, you know, so one set of health advice could be, you know, try and not get caught up in Nazi, Nazi, Nazi occupation and, you know, try not, be, try not to be pregnant in the first trimester at this point in time. That would be one public health message from the conference, I suppose. Um, but beyond that, it starts to get, you know, very much less obvious. Um, and that's, that's you know, at one level, that's the basic beef with the whole thing. You know, Marcus says these can be enduring. Well, it should, sure, it's a proposal. It, can, it is a proposal for enduring effect. But you want to check that at all sorts of, in, that, check that at all sorts of levels. You want to check it statistically, and that's the kind of thing that Kabat does with all the kind of health risks that we're normally talking about in the, in, the, in the public. And you want to check it at a kind of causative level as well. You want to see if you've got some plausible mechanism. You know, if you're going to hypothesise something that's a little bit speculative, you want to see if it doesn't actually make sense, some kind of plausible... And often that's missing. So we, once you go beyond the kind of famous study and into other studies, smoking is, is one that works a bit. Marcus has done some work on. After that, it's tricky. Even with rats, you force feed rats. That it seems to go all sorts of ways. Mice, force feed them, goes all sorts of ways, the effects. Sometimes they're just charting an effect by just charting all these methylation pat patterns without really knowing what it means. It's a, it's a kind of you know, huge amount of data. But OK, thank you. I I'm going to take a large, big round of questions. Uh, Ellie Lee, uh, Centre for Parenting Culture Studies. Um, I don't really know why you seem so um, averse to allying yourself to Lamarckianism um, and 19th century articulations. Indeed, a lot of what you said even sounds to me like a complicated version of maternal imprinting. I mean, it really does sound like that. It sounds like the form of thought that emerged in the 19th century, which basically said that social experience and social problems can be best understood through um, biological theory, and you generate a biological metaphor for social experience and social problems. And I would argue that where this is going is actually then even worse than the 19th century. Um, I mean, if you look at public health policy, it's already been reorganised around the lifestyle approach with an entire programme of behaviour modification coming out of it. Maternity services are now organised on a whole range of bossy interventions into the lives of pregnant women. It's already happened. Um, and I think that you need to at least have a bit more of an honest account of what you're saying here, other than John. Listening to, uh, particularly to Professor Monk and Professor M uh, Pembry, I'm struck by how reassuring it must be for a scientist to find that the results of their scientific research so closely confirms <laughs> contemporary prejudices, particularly in the sphere of uh, issues of lifestyle and parenting and behaviour, uh, somewhat along the lines of the point that's just been made. 
Uh, I, th I found it really astonishing to hear Professor Monk particularly moving almost in one sentence from talking about the methylation of uh, adenosine and DNA transcription to talking about stress during pregnancy and parenting. And I'd venture to suggest that Professor Monk uh, uh, no doubt has, uh, is eminently qualified to talk about DNA transcription and the molecular biology, but I'm not sure what qualification she has to speak about parenting or questions of stress and, and uh, obesity and all these other issues. Um, I'm struck by uh, the, the relevance here of a critique of co uh, what one American critic calls parascience, the, 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 the fact that many contemporary scientists fail to practice the sort of self-discipline and self-criticism which is distinctive of proper science. And that seems to be a real problem. Final point about uh, John Gillett quoted uh, uh, Jeffrey Cabot's work. It's quite interesting to see it, that Jeffrey Cabot's collaborator, Jim Enstrom, whose work the, the was, the provoked that book, he published some research which didn't, didn't confirm popular prejudices because his research on uh, passive smoking didn't confirm the prevailing view about passive smoking. Jim Enstrom lost his job as a result of it. I wasn't going to mention this, but I think I will mention that I actually have a genetic disease and my family is riddled with diabetes, which you suggest might even be connected to the fact that they were originally pogrom survivors um, from the late 19th century and Holocaust survivors as well. Um, but what I was actually going to ask was, in contrast to the other two speakers, to what degree will this enable us to target intervention at those groups we consider at risk? Uh, I'm not a biologist, so um, I'm just... You can, I want you to correct me, basically. So I understand that uh, you're suggesting that uh, epigenetics uh, might be or is a new type of uh, introducing variation in the evolutionary theory. And if we understand how this uh, environmental effect connects to the genetic uh, uh, composition of our uh, stem cells, basically, mm -hmm. we can uh, decide how to change ourselves, so you have a new type of inheritance. So I would like you to make a comment on how this uh, influences the modern synthesis and our understanding of evolutionary biology. Thank you very much. I'll, I'll come back to the panel, there's a lot mm. on the table before going out again. Uh, just to round some of it up, Marilyn and Marcus, you might want to respond to the charge that you are indeed uh, Lamarckians, mm. uh, criticism that you perhaps you leap from uh, the molecular level to parenting uh, too quickly. And as for all of you, you know, whether, whether the, is, the pop, is the current popularity of epigenetics because it confirms certain prejudices, given that it was coined 70 years ago? Mm. It, are there epigenetic theories that don't confirm popular prejudices? If you smoke, may your children be able to smoke with fewer adverse consequences? Uh, might, we, might we be able to target interventions better? Uh, where does evolutionary uh, biology stand in light of it? You'll have to cherry pick uh, whatever you'd most like to respond to, beginning with you, Marilyn. Okay. Well, bringing behaviour to the molecular level, I mean, uh, there are very clear experiments done with parenting, for example, in animal models such as rats, and you can have good rat mothers and poor rat mothers, and the pups can be analysed as adults to see what's happened to their genes. And uh, what, in using a very sort of high throughput technique, in the rats, adult rats who had very poor parenting from their mothers, they have actually 235 genes turned off in the hippocampus, which is a part of the brain which is very sensitive to changes in environment. Now you can say, well, that's, that certainly connects behavior uh, to silencing of gene expression. With, you know, it's, you can't argue with that. And you can say, oh, well, that's a rat. But the authors in Canada uh, also studied humans who had committed suicide and they could divide the humans who had committed suicide into two groups, those that had had a terrible beginning in life and those that hadn't but something awful had recently happened to them and they found the same thing in the hippocampus of the suicide victims uh, that large numbers of dreams were turned off in the hippocampus like in a rat, uh, the ones that had had very poor parenting and also, there was a much poorer development of the hippocampus. It was smaller and had less ribosomes and so on. So there's definitely molecular correlations with adverse life conditions. I slightly regret at the end of a deliberately speculative paper uh, published in 1996 um, with the title of uh, Genomic Imprinting, 
uh, is this a, a means of modulating gene expression in relation to um, see changes in the environment in the subsequent generations? I ended it right at the end by saying it's time we neo-Lamarckians came out of the closet. And uh, in fact, I've regretted it ever since. It was just a throwaway line right at the end. Um, the point is that Lamarck conflated two things, and that was the adaptation that can occur in biology uh, coupled across the generations too, and the evolutionary process. Um, I think that the epigenetic uh, phenomena we're looking at, um, particularly where we have transgenerational responses, is an adaptive process, and in its evolved adaptive process. These, the, the system, just like the imprinted gene system, has evolved, and it has a DNA sequence basis. It's just that we've evolved to be more responsive in certain ways. And my broad view, coming back to responsiveness and so on, is, uh, the point you made, uh, um, plasticity, somebody made, um, is that uh, the humans, uh, in fact, uh, are characterised by marked responsiveness and a payoff between responsiveness and stability. You cannot be really responsive if you are very stable. We know that from jet airplanes. Uh, they have to be so unstable in the air that they're controlled by uh, uh, computer-operated flaps. Otherwise, they fall out of the sky in order to avoid missiles. And it's the same with humans. And uh, recent data are showing that our, DNA, our genomes are very unstable compared with um, uh, chimpanzees, with uh, uh, bits coming out and so on. And I think that's part and parcel of an evolved increased responsiveness and epigenetic regulation is the mechanism by which we have uh, uh, these different responses. So we have bat models, aeroplane models, uh, we have uh, um, Canadian suicides. Um, are you convinced? No. I mean, the, the difficult thing with this is unpicking it, because there's so many different things get tossed in the pot, you know, mm. from broad, subtle differences in approach to evolutionary theory... Uh, that Marshall has been talking about, you know, background assumptions that different people have about how evolution works, to, you know, how one views, you know, rat studies and all the rest of it. I mean, I could, maybe I'll come back later on, perhaps, if we, go, if we return to the yeah, market, yeah. I'll return to it. Just say something about the, the, the studies, all this kind of thing. I think the, the problem is, again, that, the, I mean, Marlon used the word terrible parenting can lead to adverse outcomes in, in later life, and then the comparison made with the rats is, well... As far as I remember, the thing about these rat studies is what they consider to be terrible rat parenting is absence of licking. Okay, so these, these rats aren't licked very much, which then doesn't trigger the right kind of cascade um, you know, hormonally within the, within the pups. Now, yeah, that's rat parenting for you. You know, you get licked or you don't get licked. Um, obviously, we'd like to imagine, hopefully, that there's a bit more to it in human parenting. But let's just switch to human parenting. We're talking about terrible. Now, okay, let's say, for the sake of argument, that terrible parenting whatever that is, may lead to some adverse outcomes. We're back then to this whole thing about enduring effects. See, what the, epi what the epigenetics people want to say is that any enduring effect, especially an enduring effect which lasts beyond the environment changing, so these students going to John Hopkins, if it endures, then it must be epigenetic, it must be biological, it must be back to a kind of naturalistic thing, whereas what they dismiss, often in one or two sentences, is let's just assume the data's true for the minute, so we slightly set aside Kabat's kind of uh, argument. They dismiss the whole idea that enduring can simply be a constant reinforcement of psychology and life patterns. Um, now that's considered implausible. So an epigenetic, a speculative, un unfounded, no evidence epigenetic hypothesis is quite reasonable, whereas a reinforcing day by day, year by year um, pattern of psychology and, and life experiences, that's all flaky. Okay. I'd like to sort of agree with the two people at the back that there's a potential for this um, type of area to be like contemporary neuroscience sort of on steroids, really, mm. because you have really interesting science and, like, the actual hard science I'm, I'm very excited by and, and, and looks great, but the political implications for it are kind of scary given the way that, um, you know, so, say, for instance, in, in early years intervention in neuroscience, oh, well, we need to intervene with parents to prevent them screwing their children up. Um, now we have a situation where everyone, all the time, 
has to be prevented from potentially damaging their grandchildren's DNA. And also, just to throw in as well, the, the question as to whether social change has anything to do with this at all, because I would imagine most people have pretty terrible uh, upbringings in the Middle Ages, for instance, and we seem to move beyond that, so whether epigenetics has much to do with that. Okay. Over here, please. Yes, I wonder if uh, Professors uh, Monk and Pembray will comment. Um, how far do you think, uh, well, clearly nutrition has an effect on epigenetic processes, I take it. Could you give some examples of that? But more particularly, do you think uh, mental activity of different kinds, like visualizations, for example, um, can impact on epigenetic processes? I'm a veterinary student, so I'm just wondering uh, how relevant epigenetics is to a... Uh, say, breeding a good stallion racehorse, I mean, several generations down the line. I mean, is something that you do to that racehorse going to establish how successful those offspring are going to be? And beyond that, I mean, how relevant is this to, say, farming? I mean, if you have stressed wheat, I mean, if several generations down the line, are you going to have wheat that doesn't sort of... But uh, I have actually got a second point. Quickly, though. Above all that. You mentioned that uh, DNA is reshuffled or... To, to that effect, and that's down to epigenetics. I mean, I did have a degree in virology. I always assumed that I was down to uh, the amount of repetitious DNA in one's genome down to endogenous viruses. I just wanted to um, draw, uh, sort of bring up the case of the Romanian orphans, which is obviously quite a famous case where children were raised in obviously appalling conditions in Romanian orphanages, but many of them were adopted into British homes after that. Um, now, lots of follow-up studies have shown that while some of those children, especially the most more severely affected, had some enduring problems, many of them actually showed substantial rec recovery um, of intellectual function, social behaviour, and so on, and, and sort of physical function. So while there appears to be, you know, it's sort of difficult to square that completely with some of the epigenetics arguments, because you might expect that some of those changes would be permanent and last for life, and that, that doesn't seem to be always the case, even in quite extreme cases like that. Just a tangential question, not really to do with the core subject matter, but related. Uh, shouldn't this, what we're learning about genes, uh, how little we uh, actually consciously know about our underlying reasons, the things which shape our behaviours, so much of it is invisible to us, opaque to us, doesn't, shouldn't that render us as a society more sympathetic for the actions of just about everybody? I think hard scientific evidence uh, supporting things that we actually know are harmful uh, is very useful. And examples of that would be about stopping smoking or getting, you hardly ever see a pregnant woman smoking or drinking now. And this is because we have the hard scientific evidence that these things are really do damage your health pretty irreversibly. And the second thing I want to say in terms of the specificity, I talked about several hundred genes turned off with bad mothering. The licking and grooming is an, just one aspect of bad mothering. You've got neglect, abandonment, and abuse to add to that, possibly, if the mothers are distressed. As well as the genes that have been identified that are totally turned off, and that's a large number, 200 genes, and they have knock-on effects because a lot of them are signaling molecules, cell surface receptors, and so on. But there are specific genes associated with what's called the HPA axis, which is a hypothalamus pituitary adrenal axis, where genes can be identified that actually identify which show that the individual is stressed. And you can, and for instance, the glucocorticoid receptor, which mops up cortisol, which is a stress hormone, and gets us to want to fight, flight, and freeze very uselessly if we're stressed, um, you can show that that becomes turned off. So there's quite specific effects in the hippocampus. Now, with terms of stability and reversibility, uh, we know that epigenetic program is stable. Your nerve doesn't suddenly turn into muscle. Your muscle doesn't suddenly turn into skin. It's very stable, and, but we know that it's superimposed on the DNA because you could take a skin cell, take the nucleus, put it into an anucleate egg, and it'll deprogram. And it'll deprogram to tabula rasa and can make a whole individual. So you can, make, you can clone an individual from a, a differentiated epigenetically programmed skin cell. So you can deprogram and get it to do the job again. In terms of whole people, uh, when people have had a very bad start in life, and I'm just talking about sociologically and psychologically, and tend to have a continued bad run, get expelled from school, juvenile offenders, get into trouble and so on, um, there are turning points, they're rare, and they're always associated with a complete removal from the uh, system 
that the child belongs to. So they, like, they meet a nice girl in the pub, gravitate to her peer group, her family, they go overseas, get educated, and a complete 24-7 change in, uh, in their lifestyle. So things are reversible, and that's a really interesting question and where the work has to proceed in the future. Thank you very much, Marilyn. Uh, Marcus, your concluding thoughts, please. Yes. <clears throat> You're absolutely right, the people at the back, um, that there is a danger with the um, popular notion of epigenetics that we are going to, there are going to be self-fulfilling prophecies of this and that. Uh, and we do have to have rigorous uh, science in this area. And uh, that's partly why uh, I spent, uh, since 1988, um, working with the Avon Longitudinal Study of Parents and Children. These are 14,000 uh, children who've been followed throughout life. They're 21 now. We do have to take into account, best we can, uh, the social patterning. The, um, I, when something endures, uh, the first thing to think of is uh, just <coughs> bad habits in the family, the sort of thing that you're referring to. Um, uh, it endures because every day you're reinforcing the same bad patterns, and so you end up with, a, with, with the disease at the age of 40. Um, there are subtle ways in which the DNA variation that the parents have could actually induce some of the behaviours, make them more likely to have that, those behaviours in one generation, and also, if they're transmitted to their offspring, re result in an increased risk of these later diseases. So we're perfectly well aware of these, and we need large cohorts where we can actually look at this in a meticulous way. And we are beginning to do that. Uh, the Swedish data that I quickly referred to, we set out in the Ausbat study, Jean Golding and I, to see whether we could replicate the general two points. One was that there was uh, a carryover effect down the male line, the sperm or something related to it was carrying information from father to offspring, and also that the time that this happens for the exposure was a particular time in early childhood. We showed, and we've now not yet published uh, the full data, um, that if the father starts smoking before the age of 11, i.e. 10 or younger, and we have plenty of those, their future sons, but not daughters, will be, uh, have a larger BMI, total fat mass measured in every way you like, during adolescence. But those fathers who started smoking at 12 or 13 or 16, the average time, you don't see this effect. So it's a little difficult to just put it down to habits in the family. And so we have, like all good science, incrementally go forward. And the public health thing it, on the folic acid, we give a lot of folic acid during pregnancy now, and we do know that folic acid changes the DNA methylation uh, in, in uh, early embryos and so on. And so... Uh, we have to make sure we're not uh, causing harm at the same time reducing neurotube defects. Thank you very much, Marcus. Uh, John, can you conclude, yep. please? I mean, to uh, agree with Marcus on the conclusion, I mean, clearly there are some areas where this is important, and th we're talking about things with powerful biological effects at important stages of, of development in an intergenerational sense. So we're talking about early stages of pregnancy, a very important generational uh, stage. Um, the smoking example Marcus gives, the, the, kind of, the mechanistic hypothesis is to do with spermatogenesis before puberty. So th th there's a kind of a hypothesis there. And I think, uh, and there's also powerful agents which we know in other areas of life can have effects. Smoking is not, it's the obvious one that comes up all the time in, in probably else, I the, the person smoking. So this, this area isn't to be dismissed at all, of course, and there are important results. But I think that the obvious danger comes when we go beyond hypotheses when we kind of go in, out of the frying pan into the fire, as it were, and start um, speculating that this is the solution to previous failures of analysis. And this is kind of what's going on at the moment. Nessa Carey starts her book by saying it all didn't quite work out to do with the Human Genome Project because of this further complexity, and then becomes massively enthusiastic about epigenetics. So kind of moving from one thing to the other without any kind of real accountability. So just to finish where I started with the quote I didn't get to say from Kubat, I think it's really worth taking this to heart um, and thinking quite hard about this. He goes, given the enormous, he's talking about the Human Genome Project now, given the enormous number of candidate genes and new methods permitting whole genome scanning, quote, 
It is widely recognised that the opportunities for publishing premature findings before their implications are worked out will dwarf anything that we have seen in the past. In this new area, it will be all the more important to maintain a critical stance at attempts to see things in their perspective, distinguishes between flim-flam and usable knowledge, but also keeps in view, this is the back to the criticising the scientists, the social, psychological and professional realities under which science is conducted uh, and disseminated. I think that's the, this is the important point for me. You know, we should target the popular press and the media, but ultimately there's that, that kind of synergistic effect that, that Kabat's um, talking about. And the only real solution to this is, is kind of prop, proper hypothesis-driven research with a clear prior proposal to investigate and clear explanation, not only of statistics, but of causal hypotheses. Other than that, we're into the world of speculation, I fear. Okay, thank you, John. Before we thank our speakers, I want to thank the Wellcome Trust for supporting the ethical uh, battles in science and medicine strand of which this debate forms a part. Can we give a round of applause for our fantastic <laughs> epigenetics speakers?